Good morning. Good morning. I am amazed sometimes how our mornings are orchestrated. Was, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Exodus and passing the Israelites passing through the Red Sea. And on the way to church, Melissa told me, that's what I'm teaching in Sunday school. And, and then uh, Steve got up, talked about loving your neighbor. That's the main application of the point. And then the special, thank you for singing that, uh, the, the picture of the throne room. Uh, we get a glimpse of that in Revelation 15. So turn there with me, Revelation chapter 15 this morning. Would have taken us a long time to orchestrate that, coordinate that. Probably would have gotten a couple scuffles. And who knows? I, I thought... Exodus 15, very interesting. They pass through the Red Sea. They get to the other side. God wipes out the enemy. And the whole nation of, of Israel, there on the side of the Red Sea, sing a song. And I'm like, they didn't have a copier. They didn't have any papers. They didn't have anything to pass out. But they all sing a song. And I'm sure it was worked out, worked out in, a, in a fine way. Revelation chapter 15, only eight verses we're looking at this morning. Let's read that text, and then we'll open in prayer and begin to look at it, and also Exodus 15. So Revelation 15, starting at verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. One of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Let's pray. Father, as we begin to look at this most serious, most solemn, terrifying wrath that is about to be revealed. I pray, Father, that you instruct us and teach us, that the Holy Spirit guides us, that we see ourselves clearly. As we've said all through this letter, Father, I pray that you help us to see ourselves clearly, to examine ourselves, to make sure that we are right with you, that we are trusting Christ, that our faith is placed in His name and His work. And Father, we thank you that we can have that assurance that what's coming on the earth, what's coming on, on the sons of disobedience uh, is something that we who trust you do not have to experience. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for that. Father, also today as we look at this, I pray that you give us a heart for those around us. For this will be a terrible time, a terrible time. The most difficult time the world has ever seen. And help us, Father, to remember, uh, remember the faces of the people that we move around with, that we live next to, that we work with, that are lost. And as we're moving through this, Father, these next several chapters, I just pray that you, you help us to remember them, to be bold, to, to love them enough to take the awkward step to speak to them. Father, we do thank you for your word again. You have revealed all of this to us. You have, you have given us a picture, several pictures of what's coming. You've warned us. And we thank you for that. And we glorify you for what is coming. Justice, true justice. And totally making right all the wrongs. We thank you for that, Father. 
We thank you for your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, think with me. Back to the book of Exodus. Real quick, the Hebrew people have become a massive nation there in Egypt. They become slaves. Uh, a ruthless Pharaoh has enslaved them. He is treating them brutally. And God sends Moses uh, to demand God's people be set free. And God performs miracle after miracle through Moses, uh, plague after plague. Finally, Pharaoh's heart is humbled to the point to where he lets the people go. The nation of the Hebrews find themselves free out in the wilderness and they are encamped on the side of the Red Sea. And what do they see when they look up and look back towards Egypt? They see Pharaoh's armies coming towards them. 600 chosen chariots, Exodus says, along with all the other chariots of Egypt. All the horsemen and all the horses are there charging toward them for battle. And God intervenes. Remember, He tells Moses to raise his staff over the water and all night long the wind blows terribly and it separates the waters. It's a part I never knew. I watched Cecil B. DeMille's uh, movie and I thought it happened instantly, but uh, happened over a long period, all night as the, as the, as the, uh, the waves where the waters were being pushed back. They walked through on dry land. The water walling up on their left and walling up on their, on their right and they walk through. Try to, try to picture that. As I read that in Exodus, I believe it was nighttime. It was dark. And they're walking through. And the wind is, is, is howling. And it's dark. And it, it, it sounds very scary. The, the water surely being walled up is making a, a powerful sound. It's very, a very violent situation. They make it to the other side. But then the Egyptians begin to pursue them through the bed of the sea. But God tells Moses again to raise his staff, and what happens? The water crashes in on them. The water goes back to its place. Exodus 14.28 says, Of all Pharaoh's army that went into the sea, not one of them survived. Total devastation. The Hebrew people, as it, as it says there, in the morning light, see the Egyptians dead on the seashore, <coughs> floating in the water. Demonstration of God's power and His salvation like we've never seen. And it's repeated again and again and again all through Scripture. Turn back there with me. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. I'm going to read this and I want you to look at it. If you've got a Bible there, follow with me. And see if you can catch some parallels with what we just read in Revelation 15. They're standing on the edge of the sea. The evidence of God's power there in the waves as they're, as they're crashing into the shore. Bodies, there had to be a lot of bodies there. And then Moses leads the people into a song. Look at verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise Him. My Father's God and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths, of the, depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble 
pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, O Lord, which your hand have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Now that is praise and worship, isn't it? <laughs> and his focus is God and his works and his ways. Exodus 15 has many parallels with Revelation 15, did you, did you notice some of them? As we're going through it and looking at it, remember this back here in Exodus. The Israelites, delivered by God, stand by the sea and they sing. <laughs> Turn back to Revelation 15. In Revelation 15, the martyrs stand by the sea of glass and sing that same song and also the Song of the Lamb. Beasley Murray, a theologian, calls the scene in Revelation 15 the last exodus. And Mounts says that Exodus 15 is filled with exodus typology. You have the, the scene of the sanctuary of the tent of witness in verse 5 in Revelation 15. You have the sanctuary filled with smoke in verse 8, reminding us of smoke uh, covering the top of Mount Sinai. You have the plagues of, of, of judgment that, that fall on the Antichrist coming up here and his armies in the next several chapters, similar to those that, fall, that fall on Pharaoh, except much worse. And one author said the work of Christ is a spiritual exodus. It is, isn't it? We're delivered. We're freed from slavery. And we're free in Him. So as we, as we look at this this morning, chapter 15, we're going to see in verse 1, just one, verse 1 alone, we're going to see a, uh, an introduction to, to the next two chapters. In verses 2 through 4, a celestial interlude. We've seen several interludes as we've moved through the book of Revelation. Things will happen, and then we'll have a, a calm interlude showing us God is, is still on the throne. God is still sovereign. God is still in control. And then in verses 5 through 8, we see a prelude to the seven bowls. So first look at verse 1 there. Chapter 15, verse 1, an introduction to the next two chapters. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So he says another sign. He's had two signs that he's told us about. The chapter 12, verse 1, the woman. Chapter 12, verse 3, another sign, the sign of the dragon. And this is the third. The bowls of wrath that we see here are symbolic. They're not the genuine thing, the real thing. They're something that points to something that happens. It's a way of describing what's coming. And this sign is described as different from the others. Great and amazing. Think about this. The pouring out of these seven bowls is going to culminate in the fall of Babylon in chapter 17 and 18 and the return of Christ in chapter 19. This, this is an awesome sign. This, this is an awesome set of events that are coming. With this, he says, the, the wrath of God is finished. So there's a finality to this. The wicked world is about to, as he said earlier, about to drink the wine of the wrath of God. This has been prophesied about so many times, this, this, this event, this great day of the Lord. Um, turn back with me to Isaiah. Let's look at this. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, as we said in the beginning. This is, uh, Revelation has so much Old Testament in it. Striking, picturesque language here in chapter 13, verses 6 through 9 of, of what's coming, of what the, the world is about to experience. Look at 13, 6 through 9. Wail 
For the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore all hands will be feeble, or another translation will fall limp. Every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed, terrified. Pangs and agony will seize them. They'll be in anguish like a woman in labor. They'll look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. You listen to some of the descriptions in there, and that's their hands will fall limp. They'll be terrified. Like a woman in anguish, in, in, in labor. They're going to look at one another in astonishment at what's coming. You know, all through the book of Revelation, I've found it difficult to come up with other applications beside examine yourself. <laughs> make sure, make sure you're not going to be experiencing the wrath of God. What's coming? But now as I, as I look at this one, as I read that, and I think about the people that are going to be left on the earth, um, I think we need to really think about others around us. We need to really focus and, and think about them living out this passage that we just read in Isaiah. They'll look at each other in astonishment. Their hands will go limp. It's going to be a shocking, shocking time. So final. It's over at that point. Look at the word wrath there back in Revelation 15 verse 1. We just went through this, what, seven weeks ago in the men's group talking about God's wrath. There are two words that are used a lot in the New Testament for the word that's translated into the word wrath. And one of them, one of them we talked about is a settled disposition, a, a, a settled hatred of sin. And I picture, I don't know if Jerry Bridges did this in the book or not, but I picture a judge in control and calm, sitting in the bench, you know, if you call it the bench, whatever, sitting there, he's totally in control. He, he, hears, he hears the trial and he makes a verdict. He, he is opposed. This is a good judge. Nowadays we have to make that distinction, don't we? This is a good judge and, and he hears what happened and he is against this, this crime and he is going to punish it to the, the fullest extent. But he's in control and, and he's calm and he's just, it's a settled disposition against sin. That's, that's one of the words. Another word is the word thumos. And it describes passionate anger, a lashing out, an, an outburst of anger, even rage, okay? And I remember Jerry Bridges when we were, we were studying through this, talking about how people have a hard time with the wrath of God and, and God being a wrathful God. And, and he said, but, but the word that we were looking at there in, in the book was the first word, just a settled disposition. He's going to come in justice and he's going to take care of what needs to be taken care of. He's going to deal with it. But this word that we're looking at here in 15.1 is actually the second word, thumos. And it means he's going to lash out. He's going to be passionate in this. He's actually going to be in a rage. It's going to be swift. It's going to be severe. It's going to be violent. It's going to be totally destructive. It doesn't mean he's out of control, but he is reacting passionately towards this sin. The word, the word plague actually literally means a blow or a wound. These are seven blows. Seven wounds that are going to end everything. But before God does that, He reminds us that He's on the throne, that He's in control. As I said, He, he gives us an interlude here. Someone has called this, I can't remember who it was, it may have been Warren Wearsby, calls it a celestial interlude. Before that swift and violent and destructive blow, a uh, series of blows come, we see a peaceful, tranquil scene in heaven where God is clearly in control, where nothing is, is in chaos, and He is triumphant. Look at it there, verses 2 through 4. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast in its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. 
And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. A sea of glass. We've already seen this sea of glass. If you remember, back in chapter 4, verse 6, John told us that there was a sea of glass, like crystal, and it was before the throne. Remember that? Before the throne. I grew up weekends and summers down at the farm, an hour and a half south of, south of here, in a little farmhouse at the time, not the one you guys are picturing there now. But we had a pond about 200, 250 yards to the north, and you could see it by looking out the kitchen window. Um, and I was all about fishing, all about hunting, and all about birds, and, and I loved the pond. So all the time I was going over to that window and looking out and checking out the pond, seeing what was going, going on down there. And sometimes I would look out and that water would just be a sea of glass, just calm. It was mirror-like. You could see the clouds reflected through it. You could see the willows on the other side of the, the bank. It was, a, it was a beautiful scene. Just always made me want to go down there and, and experience it firsthand. But here we have a sea of glass, and we have some people standing around it. Go back with me to the Old Testament again and think about the tabernacle, first of all, that Moses built had this sea of glass, but also Solomon's temple had a sea. It's called a sea that was built according to God's pattern. Remember Solomon's temple was glorious, it was ornate, it was crazy, it was so, so ornate. Second Chronicles 4, 6 describes this basin that held water for cleansing that was according to the pattern that Moses saw in heaven, and he was to build it. And if you go back to 2 Chronicles, you don't have to, but 2 Chronicles 4, 6, you see that it's simply called the sea. <laughs> it's interesting. This was a, this was a, a large cup, a saucer, shaped like an open lily. Picture a, a lily flower, open. It was 15 feet from brim to brim. Okay, that's massive. Seven and a half feet deep. And it held a whopping 18,000 gallons of water. This, this was massive. They had, I, I think they were oxen, um, fashioned, cast, um, two of them facing this way, two of them this way, two of them that way, two of them this way, and, the, and this big basin setting on top of it. But it was called simply, if you go back to Second Chronicles, the sea. <laughs> I remember reading that years ago and thinking, what in the world? What do you mean the sea? It was a large basin that was used for cleansing. And it was right in front of the door of the holy place. So again, a, a picture of this sea that we're looking at in Revelation 15. So fascinating to think about it as we move through this whole chapter, this whole, these whole eight verses mentioned several times, as, as I, several times as I said, this, this Exodus typology. Remember that Moses was told to construct the tabernacle according to the pattern that he saw when he was up on the mountain, when he met with God, and he had a vision of the tabernacle, the, the, the dwelling place of God, the throne room of God. And here he was told, when you go down, I want you to build this. Here are the Here's the plans, and you're making it according to what you saw. And there was the sea of glass before the throne room of God. This was used... Uh, in the earthly tabernacle for cleansing. The priests washed their hands, they washed their feet before they went in to serve in the holy place, in the, the holy of holies. It reminds us, again, as I go back and, and studying the tabernacle and all of its parts, uh, we're reminded again and again of the need for holiness, that we're called to purity, that we're called not to live like the rest of the world. And in heaven... In heaven, you look at it and you think, well, what did it represent there? You know, people didn't have to cleanse themselves. It probably represents Christ and His cleansing work. It might represent also the Word, the cleansing work of the Word. But here in Revelation 15, 2, the sea of glass is mingled with fire. You look at that and you think, you don't, we don't really know exactly. We're not given much information. But I, I picture a sea of glass as being very reflective. And it's right before the throne room. So perhaps it's reflecting the, the fires of judgment that are about to come out of that throne room 
and be cast upon the earth. Now look who's standing beside that sea. Some of, some of your translations may say on. Um, I like the net uh, Bible because it often explains why did they choose this word and not that word. And it's a preposition that, that could mean several different things. And it's hard to tell in the context exactly what it means. It could be on, beside, near, uh, any one of those words. But here we have some people standing I like next to that sea. Those who conquered, it says. Those who conquered the beast, its image, and the number of its name. These are those who are described in 12.1 uh, as those who loved not their own lives unto death. Martyrs. The tribulation saints. These struggle against, as we just saw, as we saw in these, these our earlier chapters here, they struggle against a worldwide political, economic, and religious system that wore them out. <laughs> they did not go along with it. Their bodies were killed, but their souls couldn't be touched. And here they stand. Scripture calls them conquerors with the harps of God in their hands. It's a very serene picture when you picture everything that they've come through, everything that they've experienced. My mind goes to Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being thrown into the furnace, furnace so hot that it killed the men who threw them in. Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace, and what does he see? He sees them just walking around <laughs> in that inferno, completely protected. And with Jesus. We need to remember that the body can be killed, but the soul cannot be touched. You know how many martyrs, how many persecuted Christians down through history have had to remind themselves of that? You can do a lot, but you can't really affect me. Because I'm in God's hands. Sometimes God does not even let the body be affected. But here in Revelation 15, these are the martyred tribulation saints. They are safe now and secure with God. And they're singing two songs. The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. A song of deliverance and a song of redemption, right? A perfect union between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are recounting God's works. They are recounting His, His ways. And its focus is totally on God. If you look down through that, uh, the Song of the Lamb, at least the portion we're given, we don't know if that's all of it. You see the word you and yours and you, your, you see them six times. This is a focus on God, isn't it? Nathan earlier in Sunday school mentioned, you know, sometimes we're drawn to worship music that is put together by someone who has some very wrong theological distinctives, and we need to be very careful. There was one several years ago that I was very attracted to. The, the tune was so attractive, and, and it was man-centered to the point that that was also very attractive, and, and I listened to that song, and I really liked that song, and I, I thought, but there's, there's dangers here. <laughs> Music is powerful, isn't it? I mean, it's, I walked through a plant the other day that I sell fasteners to, and I don't know if you still call them boom boxes or not, but, but every station I went by, they had their different music just booming, you know, right there by their workstation. And I mean, it went from country music to rock music to old, you know, rock. And, and I just thought it, it's, it's amazing how music really does reach us and grip us. Uh, it, if it's singing about something that we're passionate about, it just all the more. It's not just the tune, but... But we're drawn into that. Here they are singing passionately about God. <laughs> Makes me think about our songs, about our prayers. They, they should be more focused on God and what He's done than, than anything else. John tells us the title of the first song there is the Song of Moses. He gives us the title of it. And then he gives us maybe a few lines, maybe, maybe all of them we don't know of the Song of the Lamb. The martyrs are singing. They're, they're singing of the blessedness of heaven, the bliss of heaven, the, 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 the blessings of salvation. The Song of Moses that we read there in, in Exodus 15, remember that it was sung 
when Israel returned from captivity into Babylon, when, when, from captivity in Babylon, when they were when they were captive in Babylon and they br were brought out, they brought out this old hymn and they sung it. When they reestablished their government, when they reestablished their their temple worship services, they did it again. They sung this song of Moses. There were several times in the Old Testament where they they go back and and they request, we want to sing the song of Moses. We want to go over again what God has done for us. And we have the words here of the song of the Lamb. Just think of what this scene and these words have meant to persecuted Christians all down through history. These martyrs suffered. These here suffered. And people all around the world down through history from going all the way back, have suffered deeply. And the church, for a long time, has had this book and able to open and look at these martyrs and relate with them. Here they are on the other side. Here they are full of joy. Here they are singing about Christ and, and His accomplishments. Listen to how John Phillips brings these two songs together. He said, The song of Moses was sung at the Red Sea. The song of the Lamb is sung at the Crystal Sea. The song of Moses was a song of triumph over Egypt. The song of the Lamb is a song of triumph over Babylon. The song of Moses told how God brought His people out. The song of the Lamb tells how God brings His people in. The Song of Moses was the first song in Scripture. The Song of the Lamb is the last. The Song of Moses commemorated the execution of the foe, the expectation of the saints, and the exaltation of the Lord. And the Song of the Lamb deals with the same three themes. This is the last exodus, isn't it? Look at it there. It says that Jesus is the King of Kings, just to, uh, King of the Nations, just to bring out a few verses. The end of verse 3. Your version may read King of the Ages. There's a manuscript discrepancy there. But either way, He is, he is sovereign, isn't He? He is eternal. He is, he is the King. It says, Who will not fear? It reminds me of Psalm 2, where God enthrones the Messiah. Where it says, just a few verses from there, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Another one, I will make the nations your heritage. Another one, kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Several reminders back to Psalm 2. Remember that they're singing in, in response to the judgment that is about to be meted out. But also, think about this, they're, they're singing this after they've been martyred. They were left destitute by the beast's world, his world system. They went through a terrible, terrible time. And as you look at this, there's no, no complaint in here. There's no, God, why did you let us suffer? God, why did you let me go through this? <laughs> We have, we have a lot of songs, a lot of spiritual songs today on the radio, Christian songs, that express those thoughts, questioning God. And it's not wrong to question. We see David doing it in the Psalms. But when we understand correctly the sovereignty of God, we understand that His ways are perfect, aren't they? So maybe instead of spending so much time questioning Him, we ought to spend more time focusing on the fact that He is perfect and He is in control. Next time we find ourselves going through something very difficult, maybe we should open to this passage, go through this passage, pray our way through it, thinking about all of the words there in that song, thinking about the context, what the people have gone through. Focus on God. Focus on His works and His ways. Moving on, look, look at a prelude to the seven bowls real quick. Verses 5 through eight. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. One of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels 
we're finished. And Melissa and I were talking about this this morning on the way in. It's amazing how the, the picture, you have, you have the Old Testament tabernacle designed after the pattern that Moses saw. You have God designing the outfits for glory, for the, the attire, splendor, you know, that's just gold, you know, beautiful uh, linen and everything. And then here we have the same thing. We have from the tabernacle in heaven, here come the angels, almost dressed the same way. It's interesting, the, the parallels. But notice, notice where this wrath is coming from. We all, we all wanted to know where did COVID come from? Where did COVID originate, right? Well, well where do the, the bowls of wrath come from? Where does this whore that's going to devastate the earth, where does it originate? The very throne room of God, right? From the sanctuary, the tent of witness. From, from God's temple, the tent of witness. Remember the, the, the tabernacle, the, the tent, it housed the Ark of the Covenant, and in the Ark of the Covenant, among other things, were the tablets, the, the Ten Commandments that had been broken by the people. A reminder, a constant witness against the people that they had broken God's commands. The tent of witness. John is seeing this real sanctuary in heaven, and the tent entrance was opened. And what does he see? He sees coming out of them seven angels. We need to remember this, that these blows that are going to end everything, the wrath that's coming is from God. And what we're saved from, through Christ, by Christ, we're saved from God's wrath. His wrath that's going to be poured out on the earth. Look, the end of verse 6. It again reminds us of the Old Testament temple services. As I said, the, the ornate clothing designed by God for the priests, uh, the descriptions that we, we see in Exodus. These, these angels are dressed in holy attire. These are emblems of holiness. They're serving God. <laughs> one of the four living creatures, I remember that's a cherubim, well, a high-ranking angel is the one who actually gives them the bowls full of, full of the wrath of God. And John puts in there, God who lives forever and ever. <coughs> nice to be reminded of that. There's finality here, isn't there? The earth... All of its history is going to be swept away. Look again at verse 8. The sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. You get, you get a picture there. Something has started here that there's no way to stop. His patience has come to an end. The church has been raptured. Just look at a couple verses. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 speaks of the Thessalonians as those who wait for the Son from heaven, whom God raised from the dead, and listen to this, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 3.10, Jesus said to the church in Philadelphia, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. That's something to thank God about, isn't it? To thank Him that we're not going to experience this wrath. But again, doesn't it make you think of those around you? Doesn't it make you think of those at work? Neighbors? Family members, those who continually reject God's offer of salvation. I did, did the funeral here yesterday, and it's always uh, when you're doing a funeral for an unchurched uh, family, you have members, and even when it's churched, <laughs> you have members who look at you like you are being so offensive by talking about God. And they sit there with a look on their face and a you know, their arms crossed in front of them and they're continually rejecting God. 
and they're going to experience this, this horror. Remember Isaiah's words, their hearts will melt. They'll be terrified. Pain and anguish will take hold of them. They'll writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Are we praying for those that we know? Do we realize that, that even though Faith Bible Church doesn't have a, 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 an established, um, what do we want to call this, an established method of evangelism, we do have an established method of evangelism. It's you and me. As we go on our way, we talk to people. We care for people. We reach out to them. If we're not praying for the lost that we know, and I know I can't pray, I, I can pray, but I don't pray for every person that I know that's lost, but I do have some that I, that I see God you know, leading me towards and God saying, you need to speak to this person, and I do pray for them. If we're not praying for those people, we need to be praying for our own heart, that God will give us a heart of compassion. Why? Why do we not care about them? Because we're so distracted. Instead of just thinking, yeah, I, I need to reach out to those people. I really need to say something. Think about it in steps. <laughs> Are we, first of all, living an appropriate life before them? Are we living a life that is set apart? Are we living a life that, that is not going to contrast with the message that someday we hope to talk to them about? We open our mouth and they say, oh, you're a Christian? <laughs> That's not a good sign, is it? So are we living a holy life before them, a separated life? Not meaning we can't be around them, but, but are we different? We need, to, we need to pray, secondly, that God will use us, that He'll open a door. We need to pray to God and say, God, I will go. I will be a vessel for you. I'll work for you. you open a door for me. Show me someone. I'll be obedient. And then are, are we ready? Maybe step three. Are we ready? Have we ever thought about what might be the best angle? What might be the best topic? What might this person be interested in that I, that I could start a conversation about, about God? Are we ready to give a defense for what we believe, as Peter says? And fourth, we need to check our attitude. We need to make sure that it's not an attitude of self-righteousness, which is so ugly and such a turnoff. Are we condemning? Are we sincere? Do we display the fruit of the Spirit? Are we loving and kind and gentle and patient? When God shows you an open door, that's when you, as Acts says so many times, open your mouth. <laughs> And he opened his mouth. And he spoke. Be like Nehemiah. At the same time, pray. <laughs> Nehemiah taking questions from the king and answering him and praying in the midst of it. That's what we need to do. As we look at 15, we see what's coming in chapter 16. A terrible, terrible time. We need to be thinking about not only ourselves, and thank you, Lord, that you have removed us from this, but also, Lord, help me to reach out to those around me and to speak to them. Let's pray. Father, we thank You again for this look into the future, for this revealing of what's coming. It should motivate us to action and to work. Father, help each one of us. We all, every one of us struggle with, with compassion to one degree or another, caring about people around us. Help us, Father, to realize that the things that we busy ourselves with sometimes are distracting and they, they take away from the fact that you've put us right there with that person. Help us to remember that's the most important thing, that we, have, uh, we often have a job to do, we have things to do, and we need to do those, but a top priority is that person, that lost person right in front of us. Help us to love them and care for them and to speak to them. Help us, Father, to be busy about this. Help us to have a full schedule of several people that we're talking to and working with and trying to explain things. 
I do pray that you work through each one of us, that you, that you open a door in front of us that is so clear and so obvious that we cannot pass it up. I pray that you give us the right things to say. Also, Father, I, I pray that you help us understand that we won't be perfect in what we say. But that's okay. But do help us to be prepared. Help us to spend time to get ready to have those discussions and to think about them before they, before they happen. But Father, we thank you. We thank you that uh, this wrath that is coming on the world is, is not for us, for those who trust you. And I pray for anyone here this morning that has not yet trusted you. And they're not trusting you for their salvation, that you would open their eyes, that you would help them to see the salvation that you've provided for them. And we thank you for that, Father, for the salvation provided through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.